but I'm babbling. So, uh, Jamie, um, I see, I've seen Jamie speak at a um, brilliant conference that he, uh, his team organised called WTF is SRE. Anybody go to that in the last few years? A few people? Fantastic. So, absolutely delighted that he's going to come, he's come along to speak to, uh, uh, to us tonight. So, um, I'll get out of the way and let Jamie get on with it. Jamie Dobson, thank you. Yeah. And then I did see a title, The History of DevOps, and I thought, who'd want to watch that shit? And then I, and then I put my reading glasses on and I realised it was my talk. <laughs> uh, that might explain why half the room's got home. Uh, no, I'm kidding. The real title, so something was probably lost in translation. The actual title of the talk is DevOps in Medieval Time, which started in around about 1996. Now, I do realise that there's a number of people in the room who were around then, I'm one of them, so is Ian. I also accept that there's a number of people in the room who weren't yet born. Uh, so for you, that will be, that's going to be a real history lesson. So I just want to start by expressing my gratitude to all the organisers for keeping this community going, especially through the weird COVID years. And it's really nice to be back here. It's definitely not my first time, but I also haven't been 82 times either. I was probably not in this country when the first meetup uh, happened. So my name's Jamie, I'm the founder of a company called Container Solutions, it's a really nice professional services company and I was the original chief executive but I stepped aside this year because I promised the 10th year would be my last and uh, I, I am in my 10th year. Nowadays I spend all of my time with our customers dealing with difficult challenges how to build momentum with the cloud migration or transformation and then how to maintain it once we started moving. So that's my uh, speciality, my expertise. I started off as a developer. I, I still think I'm a developer, although most of my team at Container Solutions would probably not exactly describe me in those words. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, DevOps in medieval times. Uh, Matt hinted at this earlier. There's no real definition of DevOps. It can't be found. Some people think it's a philosophy. Some people think it's a collection of tools and practices. Other people think it's a role in a team that you can write a job specification for, right? Everybody has a different point of view. For me, it's about speeding up the system's delivery life cycle. Not the software delivery life cycle, the system. How to go from an idea, code it, and get it into production in a safe and sensible manner. Which if you're in a bank, that really matters. So it's not going as fast as possible, it's, it's about going as fast as what is safely possible. Now I'd like to talk about three things. So the, for those, who, those of you who know me outside of work, uh, I'm a bit of a nerd, and recently I've been nerding out on the history of computing. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Three things specifically. The first one is this ancient argument. Uh, this is not about medieval times, this is way before 1996. This is the 1940s and 1950s. So there was an ancient argument, and it went, was, was something like this. What are computing machines used for? Are they big calculators? Is that their destiny? They take punch cards in, do some processing, and a result comes out at a later moment. Or could there be something else? Now, most people who were working with computers thought that this argument was resolved at least by about 1976. But in 1996, when humanity, for the first time ever, started building applications for the web, global web-scale applications with not thousands of users but hundreds of thousands of users, this old conflict re-emerged. That's what the second thing is, but that's the second thing I'd like to talk about. And then finally, are there any patterns, are there any patterns from history that might help us in the future or maybe more practically right now in the present? What can we learn from the 90s and the noughties that is applicable right now today? So without much any more messing around, let's get busy. What was this ancient argument? Uh, does anybody recognise that person? Oh, Tim Berners-Lee. No, it's not Tim Berners-Lee, he's an American, this guy. So that's... It's not Norbert Wiener. No, Norbert Wiener was long dead when this photograph was taken. That's John McCarthy. Now, John McCarthy famously in, 19, in the 1960s at uh, the MIT's celebration, 100 year celebration, he predicted uh, cloud computing as we know it today. And not only that, he said business models would change. A company would subscribe to the computer utility or the computer grid as he saw it, and customers of the business would subscribe to them. Now that's exactly what happens today. We pay Netflix and Netflix, Netflix play Amazon. So John McCarthy was quite forward thinking. Now 
he grabbed a bunch of money from ARPA, that's the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was part of the Department of Defense, and he put together the world's first, does anybody want to guess, what did he put together? The world's first computer programming course. That had never been done before. And he attracted members of the Model Railway Club. So MIT, back then, like today, has a very active Model Railway Club. And they loved this. They loved this computer programming. They would meet up to work on their models in the evenings, on the weekends, and anything that was particularly ingenious, like a little electronic junction or a bridge that went up and a tunnel that went down, they had a name for that. Does anybody know what the Model Railway people called that ingenious rail design? Oh, nobody. Anybody? Anyone want to guess? It was called a hack. So the, the model railway people were the original hackers. hackers. Hacks were ingenious, but sometimes they were also mischievous. So the, the model railway club people were very proud of their hacks, and they were always coming together, drinking beer, a bit like we are tonight, and hacking away on their models. Now, it did not take long for the hackers from the model railway club to discover this thing. This is a transistorized computer. It's the TX0. It was on the first floor of the computer building at MIT. The hackers broke in and anonymously they wrote a computer program. Uh, and the computer program got a name. It was called Expensive Typewriter. Now, when the professors discovered this, they went absolutely ballistic because they wanted to know why were these young students messing around with this very expensive $5 million in 1960s dollars computer. And worse than that, how had they managed to change this multi-million dollar machine into a $200 typewriter? It got worse for the professors because the next week they came back and there was a new program. This one was called Expensive Calculator. <laughs> And it could do simple addition and subtraction. So they'd reduced the, the computer to the functionality of a $150 desktop calculated machine. This is the root of the ancient argument. McCarthy and the young turts from MIT, they felt that computer programming was an iterative process. That's how they developed expensive typewriter. A process whereby you coded a bit, tested what you'd done, take the feedback from the machine and keep going. The ancient professors didn't see it like that. They saw the computer as an expensive calculating machine. And it was the most important thing was to prepare your programs in advance and diligently, and thus increase the chances of you getting your, your program right first time. Needless to say, they thought all this messing around and iterative development was an absolute abhorrent waste of machine time. The students, on the other hand, thought that messing around and trying to get your program right the first time around was an abhorrent waste of human time. This argument went on and on and on for years and years and years. And there was a fight. Now, these machines were expensive, really expensive. So they were in climate controlled rooms, they, they, the temperature uh, was controlled, they had fire suppression, they had failover generators in case the power cut, etc, etc. So you wanted to have some rules and procedures to protect these machines. But what actually happened is a priesthood, not my words, the words of the people back then, emerged around these mainframes and the pace of programming was therefore not dictated by how quickly you could prepare your punch cards or your paper tapes, but it was dictated by the high priests of the mainframe or the computer room. This was a difficult and extremely depressing time to be a computer programmer. <laughs> These are the priests. I don't think they looked exactly like that. Um, but nobody knew what they looked like because you used to hand your programs through a little envelope, a little slot in the, in the computer room. The hackers fought back, they did fight back. Their solution was a piece of software, it's called time sharing software. And what time sharing did was allow a mainframe to be shared by multiple users at the same time. Now you're thinking, how's that possible? And the reason it was possible is because the time it takes for clumsy humans to press keys and press enter uh, is a pretty long time for the computer to switch between users, thus creating the illusion that you had unfettered and private access to the machine, which is all these programmers ever wanted. And it wasn't just the academics in MIT, all the students, it was clerks right here in London and in the United States, people at, for example, oh, what's my, what was 
What's that company? Lions. Does anybody remember Lions Cakes? Lions Battenberg? They had the first computer in the UK. It was called the Leo, the Lions Electronic Office. Did you program it? My, my mother in law worked. Your mother, it, it wasn't Mary Coombs, was it? Um, I more increases. So Lions Tea Company here in the United Kingdom hired the very first commercial computer programmer ever. It was a woman, she was called Mary Coombs. The history of computing doesn't have women in it, not because they were not around, but because mainly they've been written out of the history of computing. This is something that some people like me are trying to address right now. So it wasn't just the spoil model railway people that wanted unfettered access, it was real people doing computer programming for a living. Eventually, this conflict was resolved. Timesharing came in and it looked like it was going to become the dominant model of computing. And actually, by the way, it was a proto-cloud. So all the problem with user management, security, and all the things that re-emerged when cloud computing emerged, we'd already tackled them in the 70s. But timesharing did not become the dominant model of computing. Does anybody know why? The fucking microchip. Right? The microchip. Intel in 1971 invented, what, well, based on the microchips, what was known as a microprocessor. It's basically a computer on a single chip. By 1976, computers were powerful enough to sit on a desktop. You didn't need to log into a timesharing machine. So eventually, I think history proved McCarthy and the young techs of MIT right. Computer programming is a creative process whereby the user or the programmer interacts with the machine and in doing so gets themselves into a creative mode and starts to cook up and dream up and produce computer programs that previously they wouldn't even have been able to dream of. By putting the high priest of the mainframe there, you are stopping that creative process. It's like trying to ask somebody to create a sculpture when they can't actually touch the clay. It's impossible. So, I was raised in a time, the 1970s, where there was no such thing as time sharing. I had my first computer when I was only eight or nine. It had BASIC on it. BASIC was invented as part of time sharing. Oh, I was busy programming already when I was nine, 10, 11, 12, and I was used to unfettered and private access to my computer. Imagine my horror when I went to work for the first time as a professional computer programmer and discovered people who worked in IT infrastructure. That was a shock um, because I couldn't get all my own way. So, this conflict actually started to re-emerge. This is a man called David Shaw. Does anybody know David Shaw? He doesn't, he doesn't, he's not a public figure, but he's a very important figure in the history of computing. David Shaw got his PhD from Stanford University. He skipped back to New York, where he became a professor of computer science at Columbia. Uh, and then he decided he wanted to make a fortune. So, in one of computing's greatest uh, twists of irony, he started a company above a communist bookstore in Manhattan in New York. Everybody thought uh, D.E. Shaw and Co. was an investment firm. But not if you asked David. If you said to David, what is it you do, David? He'd say, well, we're actually, we're a technology firm, but we just happen to make money with investing. And as the company gets older and continues, you know, we'll, we'll apply computers and the Brainiacs who programmed them to different domains. Right then in the 80s, what they were specialising in was automatic trading. That had never been done before. And David came to this conclusion because he was a computer scientist. He wasn't a finance person. He was like, right, give me some computers, give me some programmers, I'll find ways to make money with them. This is why it wasn't totally weird when the internet arose from, uh, from the obscurity of the Department of Defence uh, and academia in the early 90s and became a public thing. David's like, right, our time has come, how are we going to make money with this internet thing? He gave the homework to a pasty-faced, overweight, his hair was already receding, young associate of David Shaw and Co called Jeff. Now, Jeff's job was to go and figure out how to make money with this internet thing. The first idea they cooked up was a type of webmail. So you would log into a browser, bearing in mind in 1994, I don't think Mosaic had even been completed. This idea, you'd log into a web browser so you could send each other emails. 
The second idea was for trading. If people could use the web to privately trade shares, that would be a good idea. Maybe we could make some money doing that. That was the kind of line of work they were already in. But the third idea was really good. The third idea was a platform whereby sellers of any products and buyers of any type would be brought together on some sort of internet application and they could buy and sell anything from each other. But there was an egalitarian twist. David Shaw was a computer science professor. That means he was a left-leaning, democratic, egalitarian uh, computer science professor because actually they were all a bit like that. Um, so the egalitarian twist was that users would be able to leave feedback about their experience. So communities of real people would grow around this platform exactly as communities of real people had grown around time-sharing computers. They called it the everything store, this idea of theirs. It was such a good idea that Jeff immediately resigned and decided to build the everything store himself. The first name he came up with was Kadabra, from Abracadabra. Uh, but the problem is, is when you say that on the telephone, it sounded very much like Cadaver. Uh, and so they're like, that name's, that name's not going to work. Um, another name makeitso.com. This was a reference to his favourite TV show, Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah. And now relentless.com was actually just way too sinister. People said to him, this just sounds really weird. But it wasn't weird enough for him to register the domain and redirect it to the company eventually established, which was, of course, Amazon. So you can test that later. Relentless.com, that still redirects to Amazon. That redirects about Oh, 27, 28 years old at this point. So this was how Amazon was created. Not by a Wall Street geek, which is basically the myth around Jeff Bezos, but by a computer, the protege of a computer science professor who was well and truly plugged in to the counterculture movements that had started at MIT and come all the way up through the 1970s. So this is a bunch of nonsense that Jeff Bezos is somehow a Wall Street type when he came when he came up under the wing of David Shaw. So you understand why I said it was a bit ironic that, that Amazon started above a communist bookstore. Uh, now, this is Bert and Ernie. Amazon were very quickly shoved out of, their, of Jeff's garage and progressively shoved, shoved out of their office into the larger and larger premises. Bert and Ernie got bundled into the back of an Acura Integra, that's a car in the United States, that belonged to the chief programmer. Bert and Ernie were the name of Amazon servers. And I've been trying to work out, because I'm guessing that Amazon.com went down when this was actually happening, um, so I was trying to work out, did they do it in the evening? Did they do it on a Sunday when maybe nobody was buying books? But Bert and Ernie got, got shipped across town in, a, in the back of a car. But the problem for Amazon is their success kept growing and growing and growing. And all of a sudden, a bunch of problems started to arise. They were scaling problems. The first one was the strict control of servers. This is when the priesthood of mainframes re-emerged. All of a sudden, even at a company like Amazon, developers could not get their hands on uh, uh, servers. So for example, when Amazon started to do personalization, this is about recommendation, saying, welcome back, Jamie. You know, welcome back to Amazon. Is this your address? This is a key part of the shopping experience at Amazon. The developers could not test this. They could not test to see what would happen if 10 or 100 or 100,000 users were being personalised, having a personalised shopping experience at the same time. Jeff Bezos went absolutely nuts. He was like, why can't you test this? Because it's going to take six weeks to provision the IT infrastructure to run our tests on. Some of these problems may seem familiar. It's the last one that I think is the most important to me. These are not my words. These are words lifted from the team at Amazon at the time. Creativity is stifled. Creativity is not flowing. We can't create anything. We can't test down new ideas. So, do we think that Amazon were in that camp with, with uh, McCarthy and the other people at MIT? Did they think that computer programming and application development was an act of creativity? Yeah, 100% they thought that. And they were pretty miffed that they couldn't create at the pace that they wanted to because they simply couldn't get access to their own machines they weren't, they weren't in a different company, they were their machines, they couldn't move as quickly with their new servers as they used to move with Bert and Ernie. 
This was the solution. This is the beginning of AWS, although at the time they were not that interested in, in building a commercial or a public uh, cloud utility. The first thing is the power structure was reversed, it was flipped. And now I don't know exactly what happened, but I get the feeling that uh, the IT infrastructure teams were told what it is they were going to do. And this is what happened. They would become developer-centric. Developers would be the customers of the IT infrastructure teams. This was the idea. So in exactly the same way the whole of Amazon was optimised to give a quick and slick customer experience when we all bought books, the developer teams were also going to have a slick experience when they provisioned IT infrastructure. This was number one. Nothing to do with automation, nothing to do with technology. It was simply that the teams who provide uh, infra would treat their development teams as if they were customers. The next thing was around standardization. They realized, that, as most infrastructure teams do realize, you cannot support 20, you've got 20 development teams, they probably want 20 different tech stacks. It's impossible for any one central team to support that. So they focused on primitives. What, does a, what did their teams need? Compute, storage, uh, the ability to take payments. These primitives were the things that they standardised on. And then slowly but surely, once there were a bunch of standard primitives, it was possible to start automating. And so a programmer could log into their web browser and order a machine with Java 2 on it and a database server exactly in the same way as they would order a book. Or, more likely, they would use the API to do that, and so your continuous delivery scripts could not only build your Java code, but also build your infrastructure. It's the beginning of programmable infrastructure as we know it today. Then something interesting did happen. Uh, you said that O'Reilly was a sponsor, so I've put the shout out to O'Reilly. Colin Breyer, that was Kevin, Jeff Bezos' uh, assistant, and Bezos himself went to a conference. It was the O'Reilly Emerging Tech Conference. And they were sat there, and the guy from Flickr, the chief exec, was on a panel on the stage answering questions about what's it like to scale a web scale uh, application. And he said, well, we've got to move quick because, you know, if we don't, if we don't you know, improve our features, we're going to lose users, and whatever users we can grab now, we're going to keep. We spend about 50% of our time building the web app. And people were like, well, what do you spend the other 50% of your time on? It's like, you know, buying computers, plugging them into racks, that's what Martin just explained. You know, plugging them in, getting the databases ready, scaling the databases, backing them up, and then load balancing everything. Vsauce and Briar were sat in the audience looking at each other, and they're like, you know, Flickr, compared to what we do, is child's play. We could probably go speak to that guy and say, do you know what, do you want us to, we could host that, it would be like nothing to us, it would be like one extra service, easy peasy, and then you can use all your time to scale your own web app. Slowly but surely, uh, uh, and you know, at, at least at first, slowly but surely at first, and then later, a bit epif epiphanically, I need to practice that word, it dawned on them, hey shit, if we could do flickers, they called it undifferentiated heavy lifting. If that's not a Jeff Bezos term, I don't know what is. What they meant was we could take care of all of this stuff in IT. So they were thinking, if we could do that for Flickr easily, and actually we could do that for all the world's businesses, we could help all of them scale their web applications. This was the genesis of AWS as a business proposition, as an idea. So. How did they do this? How did they solve their DevOps problems? Well, they solved them in, by the way, DevOps was not invented as a term, Ian, until? 2003? 2007. <laughs> 2007. So DevOps as a term was not, uh, um, was not, did not come about until uh, Chris kicked off a DevOps conference in Belgium, it was in 2006, and then that became a term. These are clearly challenges that DevOps was invented or created or a community emerged to try to solve. How do you scale at, at, uh, how do you scale web applications? How do you standardize? Should you standardize, etc, etc. This is how Amazon solved a lot of their issues. So the question is, and I'm coming to an end now, so don't worry. The question is, what can we learn? What's the conclusion of our understanding of what went on at MIT and what went on at Amazon? I think the most important point is the first point, the creative process. I am very lucky to have worked in high-performing teams. I'm even luckier to have led them as my 
career progressed and at Container Solutions I like to think we've got a bunch of high performing teams that help our customers out. What is it that we do? We optimise for creativity. When we introduced continuous delivery, it wasn't that we wanted a fast build per se, we wanted to make sure the changes we just made didn't break anything else so we could learn our lessons and move forward. We optimised for creativity. When there was a stupid like corporate procedure, some like performance reviews, who wants to do them, right? I used to help my team with the performance reviews because it was a managerial practice that got in the way of creativity. And if you look at Netflix and if you look at Amazon, and Amazon are not even shy, they talk about this like, like explicitly, all of the creation of AWS, infrastructure as a service, standardization, etc., was about optimizing everything for creativity. Because creativity becomes features, which becomes revenue, or it becomes further a territory on the digital frontier which is what they were busy with back then so for me computer programming is about creation creation and that is what managing and managing knowledge workers is all about a second theme I didn't touch this I didn't touch on this when I talked about Amazon but workforce management is important the roles and responsibilities when you becoming a DevOps organization, bringing in those practices, they start to change. When your infrastructure is programmable and the machines are not in the back office on fire, like Martin showed earlier, but in Amazon's data centers on fire, um, things change, costs matter. You don't need people who understand how to set up power generators. That's Amazon's job. So if you've got those people, where do they, where do they belong in the future? So workforce management, understanding how your people's roles will change, actually accepting that as a fact. A lot of companies are not ready to accept that. They're not ready to have the workforce management discussion. But accepting that roles change, and there has to be a path for employees to either change their skill set so that they can pick up these roles or something else, uh, it won't work. So if you look in the last 20 years, everybody who's sort of got on this journey tweaks and changes their workforce over time. So it's a fact that we can't get away from. Psychological safety. You've probably heard this expression. It's quite popular currently in uh, technology. Psychological safety is the group belief that you can take a risk or whistleblow, speak up without fear of punishment or other, some other type of humiliation. It's essential in the innovation process. If every time you take a risk, somebody shouts at you, you're going to stop taking risks. So the whole point of IT infrastructure being provisioned quickly is so you can test something. Tests, they should fail, right? You, you're not running every test in the hope it's going to pass. So psychological safety is really an important concept, but it's the wrong concept. It's the wrong concept. Anybody recognize this guy in the middle? That guy. Jamie Dawson. I wish. I wish. I'm not that old. Right? You got some you got some cheek. What was your favourite? He was hated by the British. British. The British science establishment absolutely hated Thomas Edison for one reason and one reason alone. He wouldn't grow a beard. They were absolutely appalled by the fact that he was clean shaven and that really bothered them. Thomas Edison was a brilliant inventor, a genuinely brilliant inventor. And he has a reputation for being a ruthless, spiteful, slave-driving boss. Does this, does this person strike you as somebody whose people hate him? This is his team at Menlo Park. Menlo Park was his research facility in New Jersey. You might, be think, you might have heard of Menlo Park before. All it was was a bunch of buildings, a farmhouse, an outhouse, and then up on the hill they put an electric powered railway. Edison was really smart. He used what we would call evolutionary prototyping. So he wired up one of the houses at Menlo Park with light bulbs and electricity, and when that worked, he wired up the street. And when that worked, he wired up the farmhouse down yonder, and only when that all worked did he wire up uh, one of the districts in New York City. Edison created a really safe environment. He took failure safely. The Martin Force. His nickname was Fartin Morse. <laughs> They called Edison the old man, but he was only 31 in that picture. So, psychological safety, I want us to change the way we think about this. Psychological safety is one component 
in a system of management or a mindset that takes failure seriously. It's only one component. component. So speaking about failures openly, enabling psychological safety, people associate that they can give each other nicknames, a sense of humour, etc, etc. So therefore, my closing remarks are this. If we want to learn anything from the past, uh, it's as follows. Computer programming and creativity are intrinsically linked. They really are. So automate, automating IT, pre, IT provision is not about being reckless. What does DevOps teach us? We have to make it quick, but we also have to make it safe, and we have to be compliant to the industries that we work within. But you want to go as fast as possible. If you stifle creativity, good luck getting anywhere. There's a reason why creative teams, safe teams, teams that have got decent automation, are a hundred times faster, maybe even a thousand times faster, than teams that don't. They're allowed to express their creativity, and the other team isn't. You've got to take failure seriously. I mean, I'm not really happy with the, <laughs> with the state of things in the last five or ten years. Too much political correctness, too much formality, too many hierarchies. Do people believe that we, can, that we can challenge each other sensibly and go quickly and get back to creating if we can't speak our minds? There's a lot of bullshit talk about psychological safety. I'd like to see that get baked in to practices, procedures and leadership behaviour. Psychological safety is not something your people do, it's something that's led by the people who run our businesses. So I'd like us to think a bit more seriously about what does it mean to take failure safe seriously. It's not just creating a safe environment, it's also about accountability, it's also about technical excellence, etc, etc. There is no escaping the patterns of the past, there isn't. Um, Thomas Edison showed the way, a non-bureaucratic, non-hierarchical organisation where people were uh, not afraid to fail. Jeff Bezos backed that up with Amazon. You might hate the guy, you really might hate the guy, and he's not always particularly likeable. But you cannot deny he took from David Shaw everything that we love as computer people. Iterations, experimentation, automation, and he took all of that from, uh, from his mentor, David Shaw. And that is baked into Amazon, and it came back out when AWS became the computer utility that's been such a big part of our worlds for so long. Um, so learn those patterns, workforce management, talent matters, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, oh yeah, and creativity, that was the other one. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for letting me speak tonight. <laughs>